All right, we're going to do part two of what I started last week. You've got your, your outline right there in your bulletin. You can follow along, make notes, and that kind of a thing. In the By Faith series, which is here in the 11th chapter, each one of these teachings has their own title under that heading. And today we're doing part, part two of how to know you have a real faith. Now, faith throughout the 11th chapter of Hebrews is what kind of a faith? Is uh, the word the noun that's presented, or is it the verb? You tell me. What? Thanks. Sound like somebody said no. <laughs> no? Tell me anyway. You sure it's a noun? It's a noun. Pretty sure? Okay. All right. We've stressed that it is a noun. Pisteos, the, the noun form right there. Important to understand that because when the text says, by faith Abraham, by faith Noah, etc., etc., it means through saving faith, the fact of faith, uh, the faith that saves, which points us towards the gift of faith that is given to God's elect. Uh, it is by grace that you are saved through faith, and that's the noun, not the verb. Uh, it's the fact of faith, which is what the noun is, not the act of faith, which is what a verb does, an action type of a thing. But now as we move into part two of this section right here, where we're in Hebrews 11, verses 33 through 34, there is going to come then, he kind of shifts gears a little bit, because even though he still uses the noun form for faith, the fact of faith, the saving gift of faith, he wants to see some fruit. He says there's going to be some corresponding righteous action that is born by the fact that you have been given this gift of saving faith. And it's expected. He's expecting this out of us. <clears throat> so how to know you have a real faith Let's start at verse 32, because that's what verse we did last week, and then we'll read down through 34. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quench the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Now, of course, much of what he is saying right there is reflecting back on actually some of the acts of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, which would include the unnamed prophets here that he doesn't mention, a right off hand. Some of these things would be true for them. You know, stop the mouths of lion, quench the power of the fire, uh, escape the edge of the sword, so on and so forth. What we want to do here is we want to talk about the lions that, that we deal with, the swords that threaten us, the fires that seek to consume us, and how we are then to respond by faith, respond to these things actively through the gift of saving faith that we have been given. Uh, as we proceed through this, hopefully two important things will come out and be made clear, and that's what's, what's broken down on your outline right there. In verse 33, we're going to first talk about the facts behind a real faith. There are facts that he talks about in verse 33 that need to be factualized in our lives, and we want to be asking ourselves, are these things facts in my life that we're going to read about in 33? And then secondly, we'll look at the features of a real faith. A real faith features things. You know, like today's feature film is, right? And so it's out there. We want you to pay attention to it. Uh, it's what's being promoted. It's a feature. And there are features in our saved life that he presents right there. And they're not, you know, some lower level things like they don't really matter too much. I can take them or leave them, though. This is life and death stuff that he's talking about right here. So we want to focus in on this. Now, last week, we dealt with the fathers of the real faith. Remember that? That's that verse 32. We talked about Long. We talked about Gideon, Barak, Samson. We gave an example out of each one of their lives, men who lived out their faith. Now we're moving from men who lived out their faith specifically to the facts behind how you live that real faith. And that's why we present verse 33 to you right now. Verse 33, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, Shut the mouths of lions. We got four facts working right there. 
Now, as we go through these, you want to ask yourself, is that a fact in my life? If I have a true saving faith, is that a fact in my life? What I'm about to read, tick off these four things right here. Top of verse 33, he says that these guys, by faith, conquer kingdoms. <clears throat> now, you notice that throughout the rest of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, we've been getting, in our English Bibles here, the phrase, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, etc., right? And I have told you that in the Greek text, the word by is not there. It's just pisteos, the noun form of faith, so it's faith, Noah, faith, Moses, faith, Sarah, right? That's how he's introduced every one of these things. It's like it's a, it's like it's a category of who they are. It's identifying who they are. Sarah, well, that's faith. Moses, that's faith. Abraham, that's faith. And we want to be in the same category, all right? Well, now, now he's changing it up just a little bit because the Greek, as a matter of fact, when it starts off in verse 33, when it says, who by faith, that's the Greek, oi dea pisteos. Oi uh, is the who part of it. A dia is through. Pisteos, your noun form. It's still the noun form. But now he comes out and says it. Now, this is the first time in the 11th chapter that he comes out and says it like this. I wonder why he does that this way. How come uh, prior to this, it's just faith, Noah, faith, Abraham, etc. And now, after he's made that list, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Samuel, now he wants to say there are facts behind these guys and facts that are be a part of our faith. And so... These facts that are to be working in your life, make no mistake, they are dia pisteos. They are through your saving faith. So only those who have the gift of saving faith, how do I have it? Well, do you believe on Christ? Yeah. Do you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord? Yeah, you have it. Because otherwise you can't. Because 1 Corinthians 12 says no man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now that's saying right there, that's confessing. That's not just saying the words. But it's confessing. It's by the Holy Spirit. Because Romans 5.10 says, an enemy of God, which is what we all are before conversion, doesn't say that. Yeah, that's not our confession. Our confession is, I'm God. <laughs> I'm what's good for me, etc., etc. You see. All right? So all of these facts proceed through the fact that I have a saving faith. That's the ba basis through all of this. All right, the fact of being a conqueror is what first is presented to us in the text says, by faith, they conquered kingdoms. Uh, that word conquered right there, this is the only place in the entire New Testament where this word shows up. And that might be surprising, because you've seen the English word conquer, conquered, in other places here in your, in your Bible. But this specific Greek word that's behind this, katagonizomai, say that fast, Katagonizomai right there. Uh, this is the only place where it occurs. Now, what I like about this is that when it says, by faith, by the gift of faith that you've been given, there is to be a conquering that takes place. Conquering of kingdoms. And this conquering, by the way, this Greek word right here, the voice, oh, here he goes, the voice is in the middle voice. And the reason that's important is because the middle, just like the passive voice, that is a part of a Hebrew verb, verb, tells us that the action of this verb is taken to the person committing the action. In other words, it's not you doing it. When it says, when it says through that saving faith of, of your foundation that you have, you will conquer. Even the conquering itself is that which is provided for you. See? So you don't have to worry about working yourself up or something like that. It's already happening for you. It's already there. It's just a matter of stepping out into it. You can step out into it because you have that. You really are more than a conqueror through him who loved you, right? Can I get an amen? amen. You're, you're sure? <laughs> the word there is, the lexicons give various meanings behind it. I scoured a bunch of them, and it's very telling. The word conquer right there, one who conquers a kingdom, is one who is defeating a kingdom. It's one who is overcoming through and by a struggle. That is what is given to you. Uh, it is one who gains a complete victory over something. Complete victory, not partial. It is uh, uh, to uh, prevail against a certain thing. All these words are wrapped up, these definitions rather, are wrapped up in katagonizomai. And it's in the middle voice, meaning that it's taken to you. 
it's provided for you. The action comes to you and you are able to walk out the action of conquering because of faith for saving has been given to you, and now the ability to conquer has been given to you. And if you didn't read the Greek right there, you never know that that was being provided for you because there's no English translation anywhere <clears throat> that will bring that out. And that's why we do what we do, you see? And so, he says, he says, these guys, through faith, conquered kingdoms. Now, a kingdom is a rulership of all kinds of sorts of things. First thing we normally think of is a castle or the throne and a guy sitting there with a crown on his head. But you know, a kingdom... A kingdom is a realm that is being enforced by somebody that you're letting rule over you. A king is just somebody who rules over you. There's plenty of kings out there. Money might be your king. Sex might be your king. You know? Um, lording it over other people. Being the boss might be your king. Pride, arrogance, so on and so forth. You know? Gossip. I like to talk. I like to share juicy little tidbits about it. That might be your king. Still your king. It's ruling over you. But these guys, relative to having the gift of saving faith, are producing the facts of a real faith. Faith. And one of the facts is, is that they are conquering, defeating, prevailing over, overcoming kingdoms. Now you're real familiar, of course, with Romans 8.37, Romans 8.37, after Paul says in Romans 8.35, he says, who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? And then he ticks off these things, these threats that could separate us, or, or we would think might separate us. There might be tribulation, that's that pressing pressure, flips us. How about distress, when I'm stressed, am I separated from Christ? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Sword? No. Violence? Uh, threat of violence and all that kind of a thing. Really? Are, do, are these things separating me from Christ? Rather, verse 37, but in all these things, these things I just looked, in all of them, not some of them, but all of them, the text says, we, New American Standard, overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Once again, it's being given to you. It's through him. I overwhelmingly conquer. Now, the reason uh, uh, New American Standard provides the word overwhelmingly in front of conquer right there is because, remember I told you that word we were just looking at, uh, katagonizomai, over there in Hebrews 11? This is, that is not the word right here because katagonizomai only shows up in Hebrews 11, right? But this is a different word. In Romans 8.37, in all these things, we uh, upernekeo, upernekeo. It's a compound word. Uper means over or above, nikeo, uh, to conquer, but it's actually a Greek word picture that, that is used to, to, uh, to emphasize that your foot is on the neck of your enemy. That's nikeo, to have a complete victory over, but it's like announcing it. It's like they bring the, the, the king of the, you know, the army that you, you fought, kind of a routine, and now there is a, just a complete demolishing of, by that picture when you put your foot on the neck of that enemy. Upornekeo. That's who overwhelmingly conquers. And that is you and I here in Christ Jesus in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer. What? Through me, right? No. Through him who loved us. It's fascinating because this idea of being a conqueror, being a victor, conquering kingdoms shows up throughout the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, Paul brings out a really neat picture of this conquering of a kingdom. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, it says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Paul is, is taking the picture of a Roman processional right here. Uh, where the conqueror would proceed in a procession throughout the streets of uh, usually Rome, uh, showing the wares and uh, everything that they've conquered, that they've uh, uh, taken from the city, and then there would be the army that would go forward, and there would be sweet odors of incense being burned and this kind of thing, and those who were coming in last were the slaves, those who were taken captive, and they'd be in chains, and they're, they're destined for death, right? That's his picture that he's taking from right here when he says in 15, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing. 
to the one an aroma from death to death to another an aroma from life to life and who is adequate for these things revelation 2 26 through 27 speaks of this talks about how we are conquerors and nikeo is the greek word that is used right there in revelation 3 and verse 21 he says you will sit with me on my throne just as I have sat down in my father's throne. So there's that position of ruling and reigning that he promises to the believer who is the overcomer or the conqueror. Nikeo, foot on the neck of the enemy. That's who you are. That's who Christ has made you to be. That comes from uh, saving faith and it is to be one of our facts. Some of us just need you know, to overcome the exhaustion of the monthly bills. Maybe that's what you need to conquer, you know. But you conquer it through faith, knowing that that conquering has already been given to you, as well as the supply and the promise to meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. So that's the fact of being a conqueror. That's the first fact of having a real faith. Second fact of having a real faith is the fact of living your righteousness. Living out, I might even say, your righteousness. Look at verse 33 again, who by faith conquered kingdoms. What do they do next? They performed acts of righteousness. Ergozomai is our Greek word for performed right here. Ergozomai. Uh, it's aorist, and guess what? The voice is middle again. How about that? So this too is also being handed to us. When that says that they performed acts of righteousness, it's something that had been given to them. Uh, think of Ephesians 2.10 for a moment. We are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created unto what? Good works that have been provided for us that we might, we might walk in them. See, God's already provided them. And now, as, as blood-bought believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, I am saved from death and destruction and eternal damnation and having to pay for my own sin myself in an eternal torment of a place called the lake of fire. I'm out of that now. I'm disqualified from that because Christ is my substitute. See? And now because of that, on top of it all, you think that'd be enough, but on top of it all, God then determines and creates, puts together these good works in advance for us to do, and then the other passages, 1 Corinthians 3 and other passages, teach us then as we walk out those things as a fact of our life of faith, he wants to reward us for them. Oh my gosh. Can anybody outgive this God? Of course not. And so he says that they performed acts of righteousness. The first thing you want to remember when you see that phrase like that, that they performed acts of righteousness, a person who has saving faith, and as a, a fact that follows them in regards to that faith, is that first of all, Christ is our righteousness. Christ has to be made your righteousness. That's that whole doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ that we've taught on in Romans, the fourth chapter, and it shows up elsewhere, like 2 Corinthians 5.21, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Um, Philippians 3 and verse 9 is a favorite. He says, Paul says that I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, not in Christ, it's a subjective genitive construct, so it's the faith of Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That's what I want. But then if you notice Philippians 1 and verse 11, Philippians 1 and verse 11 there is an expectation that there will be a fruit of righteousness or a result of having that righteousness imputed to you. You will act righteous. Second uh, Corinthians 5.17 says we're new creations in Christ. I know you hear this from me all the time. What passes away? The old man and the old things pass away. And what becomes new? Oh, are you sure it's all things? It can't be all things, can it? Uh, isn't there, there's got to be some things that stay the same. There's got to be some remnants. We've got to have that scent of the, of the fallen in Adam cadaver walking around with us, don't we? Isn't that supposed to be? All things become new. Because that's the kind of job Christ did on the cross. Now in Philippians 1.11, watch this. It says, Paul says, having been filled, he's talking about the Philippians, having been filled with the 
fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Fruit of righteousness. That's a result type phrase right there. Fruit is what grows off of tree. Trees produce, a healthy tree produces the fruit it's supposed to produce, see? But a tree that's sick, you, know, you don't want to eat from that. In fact, it's probably not going to produce anything anyway. But when there's fruit bearing, that means that there's health that's going on. This righteousness has to do with positional righteousness. I am positionally righteous in Christ, but then there is ongoing, walking out in the flesh, the body righteousness, which demonstrates that I have a real saving faith, and it's a fact of my saving faith that I am to, like it says right here in Hebrews 11, 30, 33, perform work, middle voice, given to me to do, acts of righteousness. So Christ is our righteousness. But remember, secondly, remember that we are called also to mirror Christ's righteousness, to mirror it, so that other people can see Christ in the reflection, as it were, through us in what we do. Now, that's an expectation. Now, I am not saying, and the New Testament is not saying, that you have to act righteous in order to be righteous. That is false. But we can only act genuinely righteous if we have been made righteous. You can only act genuinely righteous if you've already been made righteous. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, made righteous in Him. As a matter of fact, here's some words of expectation for us to consider in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. 1 John 2, 29. John says, if you know that He, Christ in the context, if you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Now, see, there's something we need to pay attention to. I, one of the things I love about John is he's so black and white. Uh, it, there's no mystery in regards to what John is saying. It's like one thing is logically concluding as a result of what he's just said. He says, if you know that Christ is righteous, then everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. See, because we're not talking about somebody who is unsaved, who uh, is a good person. We're not talking about it. The biblical definition for righteousness is not good works. The biblical definition for righteousness is a, a changed nature that is a participant and a partaker of the divine nature who then acts the same way the perfect God acts because they've been changed inside, because they have been born again, what we... the theological phrase would be regenerated. Because the imputed righteousness of Christ has been given to me, I can then walk out the life of Christ. And so he says, everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. That's why we say, you know, there is this side of the coin uh, relative to salvation. It will always show fruit, always show evidence. Now, you're not going to be perfect about it. You never will, as long as you're in this carnal you know, cadaver thing. Uh, that's going to hold us back. Why? Because something's inside. What's it called? Oh, bang! And got it. Nailed it. I know the rest of you were thinking it. She just beat y'all to it with her, you know, the law of sin. The principle of sin. Exactly. Romans 7.23, yes? All right. That is there. Uh, as long as you're in 1 John, take a look at chapter 3, verse 7. 1 John 3... Verse 7, here's another one. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Now, once again, you've got to read that carefully. John is not suggesting that by practicing righteousness, you gain or merit righteousness. It's telling you that by practicing righteousness, and righteousness is what the Bible defines it to be, not what somebody outside of the Bible defines it to be. Okay, So practicing righteousness obedience, discipleship, taking up your cross, calling what the Bible calls sin, and calling what the Bible calls obedience, you know, nailing those things, those are examples of righteousness. But when he says here, the one who practices righteous, it's assumed that they already have the imputed righteousness of Christ. So they can practice that. Because a, a person that does not have the imputed righteousness of Christ by faith, cannot practice righteousness. You can't, even, you can't even step through the door of practicing righteousness. It's not possible. 
because you're an enemy of God, according to the Bible. Look down at verse 10. He says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious, and he names it. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, <laughs> nor the one who does not love his brother. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. That's a tough one to understand, right? It's really tough to understand. It's not tough to understand at all. It's plain on its face. The one who says he's righteous but doesn't practice righteousness is not of God. That means they're of somebody else, according to the beginning of the 10th verse. They're of the devil. you got to say it that way. The devil. You know that, right? Okay. Sort of, sort of, kind of, maybe. All right. Practicing righteousness. Did you know, actually, that according to Re Revelation 19.8, according to Revelation 19.8, that we are going to wear the fact of our acts of righteousness that were done, Ephesians 2.10 style, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared for us, okay? Then according to Revelation 19.8, we're going to wear our righteousness in the kingdom. Uh, Revelation 19.8, speaking of the saints, talks about the fact how that they are clothed in white linen, and then John defines what that white linen is. He said, which is the righteous acts of the saints. Not the righteous acts of God, but the righteous acts of the saints. See, That comes under the heading of 1 Corinthians 3, um, um, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, Romans 14, uh, verse 10, uh, Luke 19, Matthew 24, uh, places that speak about the reward for faithfulness on this earth, which is more rulership in the kingdom. And now he says we're going to be wearing this stuff. See, nothing's going to be hidden. It's all going to be out front. Revelation 19.8. This is all behind the fact of living your righteousness. So we've seen that there's the fact, if, I'm, if I have saving faith, I'm going to be a conqueror. There's the fact that I will be living out the righteousness that has been imputed to me, and I will walk in that. Thirdly, then, as we look back at Hebrews 11, still in verse 33, we then get another fact, and that is the fact of obtaining your promises after performed acts of righteousness. It says, by faith... They obtained promises. Promises. Uh, now, I love this. This is, this is fun. Epitugano. Epitugano is the Greek word for obtained right here. Uh, and gain is great. Obtain is perfectly fine. Interesting. This word was used in classic Greek to describe one, listen now, who hits the mark. If you epitugano... You are one that got it. You nailed it. You hit the mark, right? Now, armatia is the Greek word for sin. Can you define armatia for me? To miss the mark. So when the text here says that a person of faith is going to hit the mark of the promises, if they're not hitting the mark, then what are they doing? What? Come on. Come on! If they're not hitting the mark, then what are they doing? Yes! You chickens! <laughs> Would it be wrong to say that to not obtain the promises of God in Christ is sin? When God says to obtain them? Does not sin defined as disobedience to God in one form or the other? Uh, promises obtained by faith and patience. We see that in Hebrews 6. We've already studied that. Hebrews 6, verses 11 and 12, he says that we want you to be like those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Promises made for the express purpose of sharing in the divine nature. I better take you there. 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter, verse 4. I'm not hearing many pages turn. <laughs> Let's back it up to 3. Seeing that His divine power, His divine power, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Man, we could just sit on that for a while. What are you worried about? What am I worried about? 
everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now watch verse 4. For by these, now by these goes back to true knowledge, his glory and excellence. By these, the true knowledge, he has granted, given to us precious and magnificent promises. What are they for? So that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So through the promises of God, it's God's will that we know them, obtain them, hit the mark on these promises. That means you have to know where they are in the Bible. That means you have to reach out and grab them as yours. Look, 2 Corinthians 1.20, ready? you probably say it with me. All the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. The yes is from God. The amen is our response. We seal it. See, So all the promises of God in Christ are yes to us. What do you, you think you're going to take a promise that doesn't belong to you? The context will tell you. You're not dumb. You can read. You're great. You know this stuff. So we don't have to be afraid of, am I being presumptuous taking this thing? No, it's a promise. Now notice the outcome of these promises according to 2 Peter 1.4 is that we are to become partakers. That's metakoi. That means a sharer. A metakoi in Greek uh, literature was, a, was somebody who was a business partner of somebody else. A partner. They were in business together. They shared in everything together. They shared in the debt. They shared in the profit. They shared the risk. Blah, blah, blah. This text is God is joined at the hip with the Lord in that we are metakoi of the divine nature doesn't mean you become God. It means you become a sharer in the divine nature, a partner in the divine nature, which has been imputed to you. What does it mean to be a sharer of the divine nature? It means to have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you. It means, be, it means, to be, it means Colossians 2, and you are complete in him. That's what it means to be a sharer in the divine nature. But you can't have that apart from the promises. That's the fact of obtaining your promises in Hebrews 11, verse 33, which we're, uh, which we're studying now. And now we come to the end of verse 33. One more fact of a real faith. We've seen the fact of being a conqueror, yes? And that's provided for us. So we are to be overwhelmingly conquering all the time. Second, we have seen the fact of living out our righteousness. There is a righteousness that's imputed by Christ to us, and then we are expect to walk out that righteousness that has been imputed, charged to our account. Then we found out that there's a fact behind obtaining your promise. One who has the real saving faith is running down, going after, seeking out the promises of God that apply to them in their lives. Man, when you know that all the promises of God in Christ, are yes to you? That's what God's saying. God's not saying no. God's not saying maybe. He's saying yes to the promises. He has bound himself to you in covenant for those promises to be active in your life. The promise of salvation. The promise of the knowledge of assurance that I have eternal life. The, knowledge that, the promise that you will never be cast into the lake of fire. Whom he saves, he keeps because it's chosen in him before the foundation of the world. See? And other promises. I'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. How about physical healing? That comes along in regards to the promises too. And right away people start saying, yeah, but, yeah, but. What do you mean, yeah, but? You yeah, but your salvation? See, but when we come to something physical, it's something you're feeling in your body right now, but your salvation, you just, you just believe that. It's not like some pain that's happening in your body that I need to go away. But Jesus Christ took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses away. Quit being all leery about that doesn't change the fact, you, uh, sovereign God, what do you, and of course you know better than that because you've been taught in regards to this. We go from one end of the Bible to the other and cover this subject. That's how we know what the mind of God is on any given doctrine because we don't pick and choose, hunt and peck through the Bible. We take a subject and we see what all the Bible has to say about that subject. Then we have the mind of God. Then we can speak authoritatively. Then it becomes a doctrine. Look at all these promises. And now, this brings us to the fourth and final promise in verse 33. And that's the fact of taming your lions. What the heck? The bottom of verse 33 says, By faith, these guys conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises. Finally, shut the mouths of lions. Of course, 
no doubt what the writer here is thinking about is, you know, Daniel the sixth chapter. And Daniel being thrown into the so-called lion's den. It's just, it's, I just love that stuff in Daniel. It's just, man, it's just fabulous right there. You, you remember the story, don't you? Uh, God had elevated Daniel under King Darius, the Persian now, had ed- elevated him to a high place, and he was one of the rulers uh, in, in Babylon, over, over the, uh, the area there. Uh, but there were other political guys that were supposed to be co-ruling with him, and they were jealous of him. They saw that he was getting lifted up, and so they concocted this story. <coughs> they come before the king, and they say, Oh, gang, live forever. You know, uh, Let's make a decree that for the next 30 days, nobody can pray to any other god except you. Oh, I'm a god. Let's let's do that. You know, and the the king is boom, boom, boom. He says, "Yeah, I'll sign that. That sounds good to me." You know, so for 30 days, knowing full well that Daniel was not going to compromise over this, they knew he had a reputation, and they knew he was going to pray three times a day, and it was public the way Daniel did it. Three times a day, morning, afternoon, and night, throws open his windows towards Jerusalem, and pray. So they got their video camera out. I know video cameras don't crank, but, you know. Oh. And they get him on tape, right? Oh, king. And so the king is torqued. He's mad at himself that he let this happen. He's mad at these guys, but the law is the law. Nothing he can do. Daniel's got to go in. And the king's confession, as a result of Daniel's walk of righteousness, is your God will save you and deliver you from the lion. That's what the king said. And in he goes. Shut the thing. King spends all night fasting. Didn't want any food. Didn't want any entertainment. You know, as soon as that sun is rising, he's booting it down, booking it down, gets down to the lion's den. Says, oh, Daniel, servant of the Most High God, has your God delivered you? And it's like, oh, king, live forever. (laughs) The Lord has sent his angels and shut the lion's mouth. <laughs> He's just thrilled, you know. Pull out Daniel. And now Darius just has one thing left to do. Go get those guys! Not only did they get those guys that set up Daniel, but they got their wives, they got their children. And in they went. And the text says, before their bodies reached the floor of the den, the lions were already crushing their bones. Is that your testimony? I'm not saying you've got to get thrown into a literal den of lions, but part of the facts of having a real saving faith has to do with shutting the mouths of the lions. Interesting observation. The Apostle Paul used the phrase that the lions' mouths were shut in regards to the trial, the first time he stepped before Uh, Nero. Um, Actually, the second time, excuse me. And I I want you to take a look at it. It's over in 2 Timothy, and it's in the fourth chapter. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 17. Interesting how he uses this phrase. In verse 16 of 2 Timothy 4, he talks about, at my first defense, that is his first defense trial before Nero, because you remember, at this point, in 2 Timothy Paul is in Rome, and he's in the Mamertine prison at this point. And <clears throat> the Mamertine prison is just a series of uh, holes in rocks, which they threw grating over the top of. And they throw a guy down in there. That's the Mamertine prison, essentially. Um, at least back then it was. And Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. And it's Paul's swan song. And he's passing the baton to Timothy. You remember that? Passing the baton to Timothy in regards to Well, I could go on. Yeah, we know. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Now, 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me, watch this, the proclamation, the preaching, might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles, nations, might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Now, he's using that metaphorically because as a uh, citizen of Rome, it was illegal for Rome to set a Roman uh, citizen to death relative to feeding him to the lions. Uh, 
Uh, I would imagine that that was rather malleable back then, but in any case, I've read accounts where you know they did in fact do that. But in any case, that was a law. Uh, clearly, at his first defense, he was rescued out of the lion's mouth. He was kept from the ultimate judgment of death. And that's how he uses this phrase right here. But what was the means? Take a look at verse 17 with me again. What was the means by which, by which he was rescued out of the lion's mouth? The text says, so that through me, the what? the proclamation or the preaching might be fully accomplished and that all the nations might hear and as a result I was saved rescued out of the lion's mouth the proclamation the preaching the teaching of what he was doing and the defense that he made and if you look back in the book of acts and you see as he stood before you know um, as he stood before the king as he stood before felix as he stood before these roman representatives and what would, what would Paul do? <coughs> After he'd get through showing <coughs> that the Jews who had accused him didn't have any proof for anything, what would he do? He'd preach the resurrection of Christ. He'd preach the hope of Israel. He'd talk about the fact that Christ Jesus, yes, died on a cross, but God raised him from the dead, and you can't say otherwise. Insurmountable proofs, and I've shared with some of those with you before, okay, in regards to that. And he, it was the proclamation. So whatever content was all involved in that proclamation, certainly, probably, I should say, probably his habit of presenting the truth of the resurrection was a part of that proclamation, and it kept him from the lion's mouth. So what I'm saying to you today is that a fruit of the fact of saving faith, a fruit, a result of the fact of saving faith, not only makes you... Uh, a conqueror not only makes you an actor of the righteousness that you have been given, not only makes you an obtainer of the promises of God, but it also tames the lion, releases you from the jaws of whatever that lion is. What's after you right now? What's after you? What kind of a lion is threatening you? What kind of a roar is taking place in your life? How sharp are the teeth? How real is the threat? Whatever it might be, tame it. How? Verse 17 just told us how. Through the proclamation, through the word, through obtaining promises. What's your category? I got promises. I got promises coming out, you know. There's an answer. There's a promise for whatever the lion is. No matter how loud, how threatening, how real the danger, or how imaginary the danger might be. There's a promise. I can't believe I'm going to do this. Have you noticed, you see, one point. One point. When, what time did I start, honey? How long has it been? Oh, I could do it. You'll give me another hour, right? What's so funny? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. Since, since I was having you look at 2 Timothy 4, look there one more time. We'll, we'll wind this up for today. Paul says, remember I told you, he's in the Mamertine prison and it's coming to an end. He knows that he's going to give his life. He knows that he's not going out again. Now, when, this is probably the second time, when Second Timothy was written, it's probably the second time he is in Roman prison. First time he got out. Now this is the second time he's there, and he knows he's not going anywhere. And so he says, he says some of the most important things to Timothy. Second Timothy is kind of like Paul's last will and testament. I know I'm dying, so what are the most important things I need to say to this young pastor, Timothy? And he's saying it in light of this right here. Verse 6 of 2 Timothy 4. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, as his life, blood, would be poured out, similar to being poured out as a drink offering, as unto God. So he even saw his death as worship. And the time of my departure has come. Uh, Analuseos, the Greek word right there, which I've told you before, is the standard maritime word that was used for a ship that was 
just loosing from the docks and only beginning its journey out, its voyage out. That's the word he uses right here. And the time of my departure. See, he didn't consider death final, like some finality, you know, some fear thing. It was like, it's worship, I'm being poured out like a drink offering, and my journey is just beginning. Analuseos. And he says, in light of that, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. What a fabulous testimony. That's the way to go out. He says, he says three things. First, I fought the good fight. It's a fight. You got fights within, wars within, your own personal stuff and struggles. You got wars without, being attacked spiritually, maybe physically. But then here, you have the war won. That's a pretty good outline. You have the war won because he says, it's done. I have fought it. It's over with. I'm done. And it's been a fight. It's been a struggle. A night and a day in the open sea. In danger from people in churches. In danger from countrymen. Hunger. Thirst. The pressing daily pressure of my responsibility towards all the churches. And it's been a good fight. There's fighting, and then there's good fighting. Because it has an expected end. It has promises obtained at the end. And the assurance of the full reward of salvation and ruling and reigning with Christ, seated with Him in the heavenly places. He says, I fought a good fight. Secondly, I finished the course. That's not a, a college course. Not a, not a school course. It's the, it's the program, it's the plan, the course that God had laid out for his life. Isn't that interesting? Paul knew, I, 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 don't, I can't relate to this. Paul knew when he came to this point, hey, it's over. All those years, and he's looking back on the course of his life. The course has been completed. It's also part of uh, uh, the Greek athletic competition, this idea of course. It's, it has to do with running. It has to do with you know the track meet sort of a thing the Olympic Games, to reach the finish line. I have finished the course. I've completed it. John the Baptist was also said to have completed his course. Lastly, he says, I have kept the faith. The faith, with a definite article in front of uh, Pisteos there, it's talking about, uh, not. it's not the faith as in, I believe, therefore, I believe in Christ, therefore I am saved. It's not that kind of faith. It, it, is, it is the normal New Testament term with a definite article in front of it that expresses all that God has revealed from one end of the book to the other that is to be faithed, that is to be believed. He says, this is something I have kept, tereo. I have guarded it. The, the verb tereo right there is a picture uh, of a soldier standing guard, fully clad in armor, fully armed, and he has got an assignment to keep, protect, to guard, to not only keep anybody from getting into it, that's what we're to do with the faith, protecting the faith, rightly dividing the word of truth and not allowing error to creep in and not letting others come in and steal out from this what they would and turn it into something else. But it's to guard it, it's to protect it, it's to keep it, it's to, it's to be a, uh, a purveyor of its truth and maintain it. A maintenance is what is talking place right here. And I will lay down my life and defend it. That's why I'm all armed up like I am. So all that has to do with this word tereo right there. I have kept the faith. I've stood as a guardian for the truth of the scriptures. With my life I have laid down. With my breath and my last breath now I have promoted it. And I've been saved from the lion's mouth time after time after time. And now I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. And now he just has one more thing to look forward to. Verse 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Crown of righteousness. 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. That's not imputed righteousness. He's already got that. Paul's already got that. This is an award for faithful service, scriptural service. And not only to me, I'm glad he said that, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. How are the facts of your real faith? Are you a conqueror? Are you performing acts of righteousness? Obtaining Bible promises? Shutting the mouths of those lions? If not, why not? That's where we need to be. And that, by the way, according to 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 10, validates and gives you assurance that your calling and election is sure. Because if you are righteous, 1 John says, you will act righteous. And that's how you know you have a real faith. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that the words that have been given to your people today would build them up, not only educate us, Lord God, but strengthen us with real Holy Spirit strength, real spiritual muscle in our hearts and minds. Lord, we thank you for these things. <coughs> and Lord, as we come to the conclusion of our service, I, I just ask, Lord God, that uh, as we reach the point um, where, uh, where we give for the support of the ministry, Lord God, that your blessing would be rich upon each person that is here, Lord. Um, for those who are able to give, Lord, and they give the amount that is between you and them, we ask, Lord, that you would uh, quadruple that back to them. For those who, are, who want to give but they just can't give uh, today, Lord, bless them back, uh, Lord, so that they might be able uh, to uh, exercise that righteousness again. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We ask, Lord God, that, that with the finances that you put in our hands to maintain the ministry here, that you would cause us to be wise in it, Lord God, and uh, that you would be pleased with the way we handle it, and we do that as worship to you, Lord God. And so we thank you for these things. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.